you know, I there there wasn't much of a gap in my kind of entrepreneurial kind of journey. I knew that when I got done with school, I wanted to get out there. I wanted to be in business. Welcome to The In Factor, conversations with entrepreneurs who started, stumbled, and succeeded. I'm Rebecca White, and I'm very excited today to welcome to the show Marty Rifkin. Marty is a longtime entrepreneur and innovator, and he's actually alum of the university where I teach, the University of Tampa. He's now located out in Seattle, and I caught up with him today to tell me a little bit more about his story and his background. Marty, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me today. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, you know, I've, I've heard some of your story, but I think I'm going to learn a whole lot more today. And I know that we are honoring you at the university uh, later this week, as a matter of fact, for the work that you've done. So thank you for being willing to share your story and for, for hanging out with, with me today and with our students later this week. Great. So, so Marty, let's, uh, you know, I always have to start with a l finding out a little bit about your background. So I know you came to the University of Tampa. Where, where did you come from and how did you find your way there? And, and did, how did that lead you to a career entrepreneur, a career of being an innovator and an entrepreneur? You know, I, I grew up in New York and I had a bunch of jobs in Florida. I had I had lived in Florida actually for a couple of years before going to the university, and I worked at all kinds of different places, even even when I was in high school. And I definitely wanted to stay in Florida. So there, I was living in Orlando at the time. Uh, I was working at Disney at the time, and I was like, well, I want to stay here in florida so there there were choices of you know what schools can i get into or what can i afford and i managed to get a scholarship at ut which was nice i think it, then they had called it the president scholarship or something and uh i remember going uh with my dad actually to the interview and he you know he walks me and he goes you know this is a pretty expensive school. He says, you got to nail this. He said, <laughs> I would really <laughs> like to get this scholarship. So, uh, but we had a great meeting and I, and I got it. And, and I, I did other things at the school too. You know, I was, uh, you know, on the student council and you got money for that. And I, I had managed to like cobble together different things at the, at the school to kind of defray the cost, but it, that it was, it was certainly a fun time. <laughs> As it should be, as it should be. Right. Now, did, you mentioned your father. Did you grow up um, with a, was he a role model for you as an entrepreneur or did you have entrepreneurial role models in your life you know, as, as a young person? I, it was, it was interesting because I was the kid in the neighborhood that sold everything. I sold coloring books and I sold, you know, candy and frozen pops in the summer. And my dad had a department store and it was like one of the first everything stores. So he uh, would always take me into the store, you know, on the weekends and I would sit on his couch. So I really got to see how he interacted with all the people that worked there at the store. And it, it, they sold everything in the store. Again, it was one of those first kind of where you went in and could buy everything in a store, a department store. And uh, one day he decided, you know, I, I'm going to have you do the announcements. You know, people like hearing a kid's voice on the on the uh, intercom to increase sales. And so I sold things. I mean, light bulbs, Levi jeans. I would read all the specials and. Uh, one time he came running in and he uh, somebody had given me because the departments could come in and give me copy to read. And uh, he goes, he goes, who gave you the brassiere copy? <laughs> I did. I did an ad for a bra. And I and I remember asking him, what's a brassier? What, what? <laughs> I just remember him laughing so hard. He goes, let me see that. <laughs> he pulled it back for me. But. You know, I spent a lot of time with him. He also uh, 
he, when I was also young, he built the first ice cream factory in Central America. So probably around the fourth grade, we all lifted up the whole family and moved to Honduras. And so we lived there for a while to build this factory. And that was really my first kind of experience. I got to work in the factory. Uh, you know, we had ice cream trucks. I mean, it was a it was a pretty large operation that for a kid, you know, I learned not learned, but more played with, you know, mixing ice cream flavors and how they made them taste good. And it was also about equipment, you know, just how things are made. And I think that's where I was really at that point. I knew, you know, I'm going to major in business and I'm going to figure out how to do something out there after kind of growing up in business. So I knew by the time I got to the school, I was going to major in business and yeah. whatever else I could put my hands on. <laughs> yeah. You know, what a, what a great story and what an interesting, uh, you know, uh, educational experience you had long before you came to college to That's study true. business. You learned a lot and your dad gave you a wide variety of experiences. Uh, you, you know, I think as parents, we don't always start out to do that for our children, but they learn so much from that. So um, you had, you definitely had that role model and you went to college. And so what happened after you graduated? You know, I, there, there wasn't much of a gap in my kind of entrepreneurial kind of journey. I knew that when I got done with school, I wanted to get out there. I wanted to be in business. And my father had also, uh, he had another business that was distributing uh, office furniture. And he had many warehouses across the country, but he was having a hard time keeping uh, track of inventory. And I love computer programs. I wrote a complete DBase 3 financial package for him. He could track his inventory, many SKUs, profit and loss. He was very excited. It was kind of when kind of software was just accounting software was just kind of developing. And I always tell people I, I probably should have just been a computer programmer since accounting software eventually got so big <laughs> and I really loved it. But that was part of it. And then also uh, my uh, wife, Kate Jones, who started the company with me, my mom had a book out at the time called the 10 day heart recharge diet. And she actually, I would go with her. Uh, she started selling it with actually one of your previous guests, Kevin Harrington. Oh yeah. Yeah. And me and Kevin and her were in our twenties and we had this book and somehow we found Kevin and the people he was working. And we did cable commercials for the book. And Kate learned about cable TV and advertising. And I'd go with her and watch, you know, when she did the commercials for the, you know, the book. But, you know, it was just interesting how, you know, your your path crosses with these people. We were both kind of starting out at the same time. I mean, we were both kind of. I, we were trying to sell my mom's book and Kevin was got this whole cable TV thing going. So it was interesting. It taught us a lot. You know, it was fun to kind of make it and sell things. And, and, and at the time, it was kind of a new advertising media, this kind of sure, late, late sure. night commercial business. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Kevin's story of figuring out that that late night time that was available and being able to purchase time inexpensively and and sell stuff, right? That's right. As seen on TV. So so you you got you so you and your wife uh are, so your wife's an entrepreneur as well and so you probably got a lot of stories about the you know working with your spouse and and your family, your mom wrote a book and you and your wife were promoting that. And so, so tell me where you went from there. You know, we, it, when Kate and I were in school, like the first kind of, I would call it invention that I came up with is in <clears throat> 1979, we came up with the chip clip, which was basically the chip that the, the clip that went on potato chip bags. Yeah, sure. Oh, we all have them. <laughs> that I couldn't close the bag. So I had glued clothes pins together and I was playing with different versions and I had mapped it out. 
And I just did not understand that the time patents or I wasn't kind of aware of it. I was in school. I mean, I had just gotten out of high school, first year of college. I mean, I was pretty busy. And uh, eventually, a year later, a guy by the name of Shaw, he didn't end up patenting it, but he did push it to like Frito-Lay and some of the other. And I was like, hey, that's I, <laughs> that's something I came up with. But I do when when you do come up with a good idea, it is, you know, people got have to understand, you know, try to patent it, you know, try to get it on paper and and figure that out, because that can really help you along the way. But now my my next idea, the water filtration device, I came up with a a basically a, it's a straw device that when you are out in kind of the camping or something, uh, people in the northwest where I live, we're getting ill, drinking water and outside. And I figured, well, there must be a way to clean the water and keep them from getting sick. And I came up with this device and that one I did get a patent on. It was it was one of the first portable water filtration devices, which today, I mean, there's hundreds of filters and bottles. We had a version that went in a water bottle and uh, that was kind of my first where I was like, wow, you know, I can come up with smart things that'll help people that, uh, you know, I might be able to make a living at this kind of coming up with stuff. And so that really was uh, my first one where it, it, it kind of made sense to me to patent it and, 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 and come up with it, you know, a new idea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, water filtration. Now, were you also a camper and a hiker or you just kind of read about this? I mean, where do you get your ideas? I know the chip clip you said was just something that you I mean the chip clip was just you know you're you're eating potato chips and there's no way to close it and <laughs> that's it's right funny because you know ideas they get out in the air because you're not the only one probably experiencing that it's kind of cuz i hear people you know almost like they're trying to do something and then oh there's so many other people doing this or you know uh someone who's maybe trying to buy or sell a house and no one's interested in that. All of a sudden there's five people interested in it out of nowhere, you know, because these ideas, they get in the air and they kind of have take on a life of their own. So with the straw, I was reading articles and I, I mean, it was like, why are these people getting sick? There has to be some way. And it, and the straw took out, man, you know, dirt, contaminants, giardia, things that could make you ill. And it was a way that, you know, people could go camping if you were drinking water that might not be, you know, you were sure about, you would not get sick, you know. And, and so I think that that it, it was mostly just hearing about problems and going, well, is there a way to fix that? Yeah. You know, one of the things that um, that I try to encourage my students to do is actually pay attention to what's going on in the world, right? Right. <laughs> you know, there's, uh, it, it, you know, today there's just a lot of noise and a lot, a lot of things, um, you know, to, to take our attention and distract us. But at the same time, we live in a world of, of lots of information. And if you're looking for that and you're starting to connect the dots, which obviously you have a real a real skill for naturally maybe, uh, but also maybe because of this, um, you know, upbringing that you had and also having a very, uh, you know, entrepreneurial family and spouse. But, um, you know, that that ability to say, hey, there's there's more than just me uh, in this, right? There's other people experiencing this and how can I solve that problem? So it's a real problem solving, uh, connect the dots kind of approach that you take. It is interesting because, and and when you meet people that can do that, you know, the people that can see around corners, it is an amazing experience. And I mean, I've met a lot of people like that. And I talk, I run up to people after I've heard them speak and talk to them. If I felt, you know, that person knows what the next thing is going to be. I mean, there are people that, that they have a, a gift. I mean, for being able to kind of see things that are not apparent and, it's not, it's not, uh, it's a skill. And like you said, yeah, if you keep up with what's going on in the world and you, you can see these things and 
also ideas that, you know, were not seen by people. Like when I came up with the gummy bear vitamin, people were like, who, what is, well, who needs that? Why, why, <laughs> there's tablets and capsules out there. You, you, you know, why are you trying to get this into my store? I already have all these children's products. And so I'm here going, no, no, this is a better way. This didn't exist before. And they go, yeah, I don't know even what you're talking about. These, you're trying to sell me candy. And so you're convincing them, no, there's vitamins in there. There's herbs in there. There's good things. It's not, you don't eat a whole bag. You only eat two. Right. <laughs> so, right. you know, those concepts, when people try to sell them, there is quite a bit of skepticism and rejection that you go through, you know, to convince people, no, no, this is a better idea. And, and you know, me and my wife like to say, you know, we were overnight successes over 25 years, you know, so it, it, it does take a long time for people to kind of see the light. And then once it, they do, it, it kind of takes on a, 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 obviously a life of its own. And right, it, right. And, the, the, yeah. the curve starts to accelerate, yeah. right? And very quickly. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the gummy vitamins. So that's, um, that's probably one of your biggest, I mean, you've had a number of success stories, but that's one of the biggest ones. How did that come about? How did you come up with the idea for gummy, gummy vitamins, which we all know now, everything's in gummy form practically? It's, you know... Kate and I, in the business, we were selling chewable tablets that were, we had done a good job. We covered up the taste of vitamins, herbs, mostly children's products. And we really desperately wanted a product that could transition into the mass market. We were mostly selling to smaller stores. I had spent a lot of time on the candy aisle. The, the concept was true kind of getting out there kind of with uh, beverages and confectionery, but no one had really done it well. The products tasted bad. Um, there was a lot of inconsistency and we saw an opportunity to get, to get our product to the next level to say, okay, can we make this better? And um, one of the first things Kate did was she said, look, People don't understand the product. Can we put it in a clear bottle? Let's just, you know, stop with the brown and the glass and the all, you know, which was the norm in the, in the vitamins and medicine and everything. And she said, well, let them see it. And I was like, oh, great idea. Unfortunately, my development was did not catch up with the product. I was trying to make it natural, not use artificial flavors. I wanted products, you know, that I'd give to my own kids. And the bears, after about six months, turn black in the, on the yeah. show. And they completely just lost their color. And she was like, mm, this is pretty disappointing. You need to go back to the drawing board on this one. I can't sell this product. And I, I remember her handing me the bottle back because she had handled a lot of the customer complaints. She was president of the company. And she said, like, you need to give me a product that doesn't change over time, which it took us a while. You know, it took us another probably year of development to get all the natural flavors and colors. Because, again, I, I didn't want to make just kind of the candy artificial bears that were out there. So a lot of the iterations and time was spent on perfecting that product and making it better so that it could be, you know, tasty and good and we tested a lot, you know, we, we have this thing called the floor test that we would give the sample of the product to a health food store or a regular store and kids are brutal. If they don't like a product, they will take it out of their mouth and throw it on the floor. <laughs> and so at the end of the day, we would go to the store and if our, the floor was littered, I mean, it was a sad day because you're like, your product stinks. Kids threw this down. If the floor was empty, I mean, we would re literally get excited. There's nothing on the floor. <laughs> and we'd look how many they gave out during the day. It was like 50 or 100. It was like, floor is empty. Well, you've got a product yet. 
you no one no one threw took this out kids will not finish it adults will Kids yeah, not. yeah. That, that's a great story. I love it. I love it. And there's so much in there I'd like to dig into. So, so the gummy bear vitamin, um, it, it, if I understood you correctly, when, when you introduced that, there were already some people that were, that were kind of going down that line, but you wanted to create a better product and a more natural product. And which of course is something that, you know, many companies are trying to do even still yet today, because we we're demanding as customers, we're demanding, you know, safer, more natural products in, in every way. But, you know, for those people who are listening now and they've got concepts they've been working on and there are other people out there who are doing the same thing or are trying it, What's your advice to them? Is that a is that a good sign? Is that a bad sign? Do you give up? I mean, you know, how do you how do you approach that? Because it is kind of interesting that that there will be um, there will be sort of momentum around the concept. Once you once you jump on it, you'll see, oh, maybe I'm not the only person doing that. You know, it is an interesting concept in itself of markets getting crowded around innovative ideas Mm -hmm. and our feeling was always because we always ran into competition and always ran into people trying to do it is could we do it better and offer something that didn't exist before and so our, one of our biggest competitors was uh, Flintstones, and Flintstones was known by everyone. They were always on the shelf, and I remember we were just constantly, a, you know, our marketing team and sales team were running into issues here and there, and I was always like, you know, get my product next to them, because if I can stand my soldier, they used to call them soldiers on the shelf, next to theirs i think mine is better than theirs and so i i never got afraid of the competition because i felt you know i'm gonna pull people are gonna still take theirs there are some people i'm not gonna get but i think some people are gonna try mine sitting next to theirs and go this is a better idea so i don't always discourage people by saying hey you know this idea is being done so by so many people, you should just completely avoid it. I think what you have to look at, is it being done well by those other people? Are they satisfying the needs? And does your angle improve what's out there? Or is it so different that you can make a difference and get into the marketplace and being able to tell the public and tell people, your consumers, your end customer, whoever that's going to be, a store, a person, internet, direct to consumer. It if you're making that difference, your idea can be viable. What I do see a lot though is we are chasing after the same idea. This is popular right now and I'm just going to do the same thing. And the point of different differentiation is so difficult to find. If you have to struggle to find that, that is a very tough road to go down. But I do find people coming up with a quite a bit of innovative ideas and you know ways to help people and their businesses and it it being crowded is not always the end all but it it, it can afford the direction or how much capital you want to kind of devote and your time because this is your life when you're an entrepreneur you you, you want to find success at some point but you you have to pick a road that where you're going to make a difference yeah, so you have to be able to prove that competitive differential, right? It's got to be compelling that you're creating value, if I'm if I'm hearing you correctly. Right. And yeah, so you know, I, I have to go back a little bit to the to the gummy bear vitamin story. You know, you were talking about the clear bottle and or the clear container, which is brilliant. Um, and, and your wife it sounds like she's a very smart lady. Yep. Um, but it, it reminds me of the story of Heinz. I mean, that's what that's how Heinz, way way back in the day, became successful because people didn't trust what was in the food because people would put all kinds of crap in there mm-hmm. back then, and um, so they had to work on the packaging. Um, to create packaging where they could put 
um, you know, ketchup in a, in a bottle that could be seen so people could trust it. So I'm just curious, was your solution of a vitamin change or was it a packaging change? In other words, did you find a different packaging that could allow your vitamins to survive or did you have to go back and reformulate the vitamins or were you able to solve that to your satisfaction in a clear container? So what happened was, uh, there was no way uh, that Kate was giving up on the clear bottle. So it was strictly going back to R&D, which is what I was in charge of. And she's like, you need to give me a product I can sell that'll last more than six months on the, on the shelf. I don't care how you figure this out. But I really did not want to go back to the artificial ingredients that were already out there in gummy. So, you know, I really, I mean, we, believed in the product. I felt it could be done. We had, I think at, at one time I had as many as eight people mixing iterations for me. And so that's, you come up with a formula, you change it, you're trying to mix different ingredients and you have to figure out a way how to get it to stabilize. So we were really probably one of the first to use Kind of stabilized colors we mix them with other uh there were some antioxidants that we figured out work because we we're already in the vitamin business so if you put enough say vitamin c or vitamin e or other natural antioxidants but if you went over a certain amount it actually sped up the process so it did take us a while you know with shelf tests and you know stability testing to get the product again through these, I, I can't tell you hundreds and hundreds of iterations until you get one that you're like, okay, this one works in the proper amount. It tastes good because you don't want to put too much of something that'll keep it from changing color, but it'll taste awful. And, and we, we would get that from customers going, well, could you put in all this stuff or all that ingredient? I want more of it this much. And, and I'd go, no, I said, this will taste bad. It might be healthier for you, but there is no kid that is going to eat this. So no matter how healthy you may perceive a product, if you formulate it poorly and it tastes bad, you might get that in your kid one time, really hard to get it in twice. And I learned this early on with my own kids because I would chase them around the house with my iterations of this product. And <laughs> they would go hide sometimes because they're like, I, we're not eating that again. That last one was horrible. You can't <laughs> trick us again. And I'm like, no, 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 it's different. I fixed it. I took this out or that out. And I just remember my oldest daughter negotiating with her going, God, just one more time. Just I'm telling you, it'll be good and getting her to try it. And I knew you don't get a lot of chances. And so I really wanted a product that would be, that was our, our, our theme, a product that would be delicious all the time, not just some of the time. You know, it wasn't, I, I, was, I didn't, I wasn't going for people's perception. I wanted them to get nutrition from it. And I wanted them to kind of understand you could eat one or two of something, not an entire bag and get nutrition and be satisfied and the product to be good. Yeah. So uh, one thing I think I'm hearing is that, you know, when you went back to solve this problem and probably as you solve problems uh, along the way, you kept that, that focus on whatever your value add was, your key differentiating factors, which I think I heard you say is it tastes good and it's natural and it gets the job done of getting the vitamin into the child, right? Yes. And it's interesting because, you know, when you say crowded market, as the company developed, obviously we've got competitors into the market. And a lot of the competitors chase more in the product. So they would chase higher amounts of vitamins, higher amounts of herbs, higher. And so, you know, buyers would go, well, you know, this product has double of your ingredient in there. You know, why shouldn't I buy this one? I said, well, that one tastes horrible. I said, you, you know, it looks good to you now on paper, but mine will outsell that one. Oh, it's only half, you know, your, it, 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 yours is 50% of this one. I said, I know because I formulated it not to taste bad. 
And I said, I'm telling you, mine will outsell that one. And we did. We outsold every brand out there. And even today, the the brand is still number one in the category. So uh, it's kind of a testament to kind of what we built that something could survive and still be number one out there yeah. in a particular category. Well, I, you know, there, there's so many things we could talk about with that. But when it comes to marketing and messaging, you know, really understanding the insights of your customer base, right? And what matters. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a parent, of course, my children are older now and I have grandchildren, but, you know, it's still a challenge many times. I mean, parents, every parent experiences it, I think, challenge to get something mm -hmm. inside of your child that's going to, you know, that's going to be good for them. That's and, you know, you'd rather get just a little bit of something good for them than nothing at all, right? That's right. <laughs> something that ends up on the floor, yeah. right? <laughs> That's right. And then also marketing is such a critical point. Like, okay, we developed this great product and I was just lucky enough to be married to Kate Jones who did all of our marketing. She was president of the company and she created these amazing marketing programs that sold the product. She was a mother herself. She understood just what you said, trying to get something into her kids that she felt was good for them. She didn't want them to have colds. She wanted them to be healthy. Well, how do you do that? You have to market. And she came up with just brilliant marketing campaigns. Some of them are in marketing textbooks today. We Sometimes we get calls, hey, can we use this gummy bite? you know, marketing campaign and, and they're out there. But, you know, our kids were in our TV commercials. If you ever look at the old gummy bike commercials, we would take them to the studio and they would be the one kind of running up to the lady and taking the gummy bike. But we kind of were lucky that, you know, there was these two sides, you know, I, I could kind of develop things. Kate was able to market and, 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 help run the company and, you know, we kind of played off each other uh, and it, we, we, we made a good team. You know, I don't, I don't know if I recommend that to every married couple out there to go into business together, but if you can find a way to work together and kind of split responsibilities, I think that was, that was probably what helped make it work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, whether it's your spouse or not, the, the it's so valuable to understand where your strengths are and where your weaknesses are and fill in the gaps with somebody else. And, mm -hmm. and I'm sure for, I mean, we could talk probably all day about how you run a company with your spouse. And I'm sure a lot of it is, could be summed up in what you just said, respecting each other's strengths and letting, letting that person really, um, you know, take responsibility and, and, um, you know, shine, so to speak, with what they do best. Right. So let's, let's, let's talk. So you've introduced a number of, of products. So you, uh, so I'd like to kind of back up again. A lot of our listeners may have ideas they want to bring to market. They may have a product already, or they, they may already be developing a, I mean, they might already be selling a product. So with your products, um, did you build separate companies for each product? Um, did, did you ever consider licensing versus manufacturing? Um, you know, what, what was the model you used and how did you develop that model? I always felt it depended on the product. I definitely was a person that if I felt I had the expertise in it, I was going to push forward on my own and try to fund it, try to make it, try to get as close to the complete supply chain as I could. Um, something that I didn't have a lot of experience in, like the water filtration product, that one was a complete license. I was like, I don't know this market. I just figured this thing out. I'm going to try to make money that way. So. It really depended on your mindset at the time of what your personal skills are and your ability to finance something. I, I, the, the, the marketing department headed by Kate would go crazy because a lot of times we would start selling something that was in my head. You know, the sales guy would come in and go, Hey, I need a new product. This, 
we have two slots on this shelf and I was like, well, you know, can we do this flavor and that flavor? And, you know, Kate would come in and go, you know, you don't have this yet. You can't, I can't start making a flyer for something that doesn't exist. You know, of course, the sales guy would come in and go, no, no, I need the flyer. I'm going out. So there was quite a bit of, you know, you, you get friction in an organization when you kind of just keep coming up with ideas. I was an idea guy. Kate was more of the gate, you know, and going, look, I get it. I mean, I mean, literally, I'd have like 15 ideas on the table. She goes, we can't come out with 15 products at once. No, no normal company does that. You could pick three, which is still a lot. But you're and I was like, there's no way they're all great. You can't narrow it down. And so a lot of this kind of, you know, give and take with, of course, the sales team, you come out with 50 products at once. You know, they're like, great, give us more stuff to sure. get out there with. <laughs> but really, it, you, you, you have to have a plan if you're willing to kind of grind out, you know, and it is a grind, you know, because you, you're talking about financing something, you're, it's capital intensive, you know, depending on what industry you're in. And the method is a lot of it, you know, depends on the direction you want to go. There's other options today because you have online direct to consumer, which didn't exist. You know, stores were the only game, you know, back when the gummies first started. But the options for entrepreneurs now are, so much broader. I'm not saying they're less expensive. It's still expensive to market anything. I don't care what you have. And it does take marketing. You know, uh, Kate has a saying, you know, nothing sells itself, you know, and I always say, no, 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 it'll sell itself. That's great. <laughs> you know, just like, nope, you still got to sell it and it costs money. And so it, it, it's expensive, but there are ways to do it depending on what kind of position in life you're in, because obviously it's your time and how much work it's going to be if you want to do everything. We wanted to do end to end. We wanted to develop the product, manufacture the product, sell the product. We wanted to own the complete end to end distribution uh, and manufacturing. So again, we were pretty busy. Yeah, yeah. You brought up, uh, you know, you brought up digital marketing and selling direct and uh, I'm, I'm sure a lot of newcomers into the space today, vitamins, uh, if we use that category, are selling directly online and having a lot of success. But you sold primarily through retail because that was the, the tradition and the norm when you first started. So um, could you talk a little bit about that that sales process for somebody who is hoping to get their product on the shelves of a grocery store, a drug store, a, another retail outlet, you know, any, any stories or advice along that line about that? Because the, getting that shelf space is, it's very precious and very challenging, isn't it? I can tell you, uh, I have been thrown out of untold meetings for <laughs> when I first <laughs> came out with the gummy bear vitamin. It was a very difficult challenge to overcome tablets and capsules that were out there. It, it took us quite a while to figure out how to sell it, how to convince store owners to put us on the shelf. So my first bit of advice is if you really believe in your product, don't give up. If you think it's good and you've let other people eat it and experience it, and they also think it's good, you have to keep going. And retail itself, much like online, is very competitive. It's very tricky real estate to maneuver, but companies do do it and they do get shelf space. And our method was really, we did a lot of free sampling. We let people try it. We got it out there because it was so new. It was the only way. Now it's expensive. Obviously you have to give free product away and do demos. And, and we were constantly, constantly doing that because we knew if we could get it into people's mouths even one time, they would become a customer. So it really, it ended up being one of our main marketing focuses and where we spent a lot of our money that if we were given an opportunity, store would go, yeah, I'll bring it in. You have to do, you know, this many demos and all my stores go, great, we'll do that. You bring it in, we'll sell it. And we knew if you're making a product that people are going to consume or see or 
be able to touch and feel and use in their life, if you're able to give them a sample, you know, that it's a, it's just a hugely critical, you know, you see it at Costco, you know, you can go around to all the tables. Well, those companies, I mean, they spend tens of thousands of dollars on those demos. I mean, it's, you want people eating it and going, Hey, I like that product. Well, it's right over here. You can, you can go buy it right now if you like it so much. So they're obviously, you know, it goes on, not there. It goes on in a lot of different stores, but that's a critical sure. method. Yeah, yeah. And you're right. I mean, I don't know how many times I've done that. I didn't intend to buy something when I went into Costco, for example, and they're giving out samples. And it's like, oh, it's pretty good. I'll buy that. Give it a try. So sampling. Yeah, I think it works. It works. So building a company, you know, you you mentioned that if if you had the expertise, you, you wanted to own the distribution channel. So from a manufacturing perspective, um, you know, what, what, what did you learn about, about that? Because you had to have a prototype built, I'm sure. And you had to do a, you know, you had to have, uh, you had to do a lot of research and development. Did you outsource all that? Did you eventually, um, hire that? How did you build that company that had to include not only marketing and, but also the whole R and D side? It was a very interesting process because as an entrepreneur, you start off doing everything yourself because you're, you're, you're trying to figure out. And so you're learning everything yourself. And I felt, okay, if I'm going to build this factory, first of all, I'm approaching equipment people and they're going, well, there's, there's no equipment that exists out there. You want to make candy? I can sell you candy equipment. That's out there. I said, no, 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 no. I have to put an exact amount of vitamins in each one of these really tiny two and a half gram bears. And they're like, oh, there's, that doesn't exist, you know? And I'm like, well, I need to figure it out. I said, I, I'm, I'm going to make a product that tastes good, is efficacious, has the right amount of vitamins. Cause that's one of the things I'm trying to convince people, Hey, this is candy, but it has an exact amount of something in it. You're not going to be over. You're not going to be under. It's going to be the exact amount. So developing that equipment it took us quite a while and we're talking years you know working with mm. manufacturers developing buildings that were suited to the process because there's a lot of you know environmental kind of metrics that you have to hit you know the right temperatures in the room and the equipment and not too humid not too hot not too cold i mean it's it's really quite exacting to make a good product and uh it's just, it was a learning process. Yes, I had manufacturers help me and we would reach out to various engineers to kind of be part of the process. But a lot of it came down to just kind of me and working with them saying, hey, we need to figure this out. And, and having a, a willing uh, equipment manufacturer, which I did on the other side to say, yeah, we'll help you develop this. But along the way, you know, we, I remember being on the floor one time with my uh, uh, manager uh, of the, the factory at that time, and he was closing a syrup silo, 80,000 gallons of syrup, which just locked up on him. And all that syrup came out and he could not oh, no. close this valve. And I, we just, we were standing there and he, of course, he's trying to shut the valve. And I just started laughing and I was like, He's like, why are you laughing? It's a, like, we're knee deep in syrup at that point. I said, it's over. I said, you're not. I said, all this syrup is coming out. It's gravity. I said, when we're done, we're putting two valves on that thing. We're going to clean this up and that's never going to happen again. And so that, that was a saying we had. We were like, this is never going to happen again. Yeah. And yeah. So <laughs> That's a, you can't afford it, right? No. I mean, that's an expensive, <laughs> that's an expensive lesson, uh, but those are the ones you never forget, right? That's right. So, so how did, Marty, how did you keep your company running through all these years of development? Were you selling other products and, and uh, how, how did that work for your company? So, I, I mean, the two things that we always were chasing was space and money. We always were looking as an entrepreneur, I would say, if you have a growing business, there's two things you're always looking for. 
You need more space to do it if it is a space intensive business like making a thing is. I don't care what you're making. If you're making a lot of it, you need room and funding. And so I really had my day job of running my company and I had my later in the day job of finding either money or space. And I really almost had cut up my day where, you know, I I had, you know, an accountant at the time and we were, you know, it was like dialing for dollars. We would go from bank to bank to bank to bank. And I mean, just you you rack up so many no's. And, and, and this was a good business, you know, a growing business, but obviously with a product that's brand new, these banks had never heard of it. And I'm like, hey, I'm trying to fund this. I, I, I need money either for a building. I need it for equipment. So you're so let me get this straight. You need a loan for equipment that no one's ever made before. Right. <laughs> but that doesn't sound like a great deal for me. Can't you buy something that's already out there? I said, no, this product doesn't exist. No one is going to have equipment. It has to be this type of new equipment. So really chasing that is is really key to kind of keeping your business moving forward but it's a it's a it's part of the process you know you kind of have to get used to it. i figured out hey this is part of building my business and and growing it if i don't have these things uh we were at at one time when we were smaller i remember you know, we got this big order, big order for the gummies. And we we just ran out of room. And me and Kate, we ran into where the offices were and told everybody, you got to leave your office. You, you go, you're going to have to work in the hall. And we literally converted them to production rooms. We put stuff in there. We were bottling by hand at the time and people did it. You know, the desks were in the hall and the Factory workers, you know, would gown up and go into these rooms and, and we're like, we'll figure it out. We'll find you another place to work when we figure out space. But, you know, you have to have a good sense of humor and be pretty flexible and have people around you that are like, OK, we get it. You you have an opportunity here to get this out. It was for a major account. You know, we couldn't be late. You, you know, your back kind of gets up. You can't just go, oh, I'll, you know, use this building next door. A lot of times there's not one next door. It's just what you have inside. So that was kind of an interesting story. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that. sometimes sometimes a big customer can literally put you out of business, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you can't. So you, you just take every step possible. I mean, what a story and what, uh, you know, it's just amazing what you've accomplished. And, you know, as I listen to that, those stories. Uh, I wonder, uh, you know, you, you said you got to be flexible and all that. The other word I'll ask, I add, a couple of words I'll add are resilient and, and perseverance. And, um, you know, it, it's a lot of hard work. You were just pointing out you were day job, night job, all, you know, 24 hours, some days, I'm sure. So were there ever times, Marty, where when you thought about giving up and, or where you had a big failure that, you know, um, you know, you just felt like it was almost the end of the line. Obviously, you you learned to learn from all your your uh, challenges, but but were there any times that you thought about giving up, and how did you get through that? You know, we for sure almost ran out of money at least four or five times where we were done. I did not have money to pay the bills. I did not have money to pay the rent. It was literally trying to outrun the negatives because I was constantly investing in it. So I was making money, investing in it, investing in it, and constantly looking for financing and trying to finance things in different ways. But we, we knew we had something good. So it's, it's very hard for an entrepreneur to stop. I mean, it's, it's a very, I, I, I just felt there was a way to make this big. I, I had, I had not put all the pieces together. And again, it's disheartening when you go to banks and go, okay, I need to do this. And they're like, no, no, no. One after the other. And you do after a while, you think to yourself, well, maybe this is dumb. You know, maybe, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm, I'm missing something. 
and I should give up because everybody keeps telling me it's a this is a stupid idea. No one needs this product. This is I get it. You like it, but it's not out there. There's no success pattern. There's nothing you can point to that says I'm going to get my money back if I loan you money. And I had no comeback for that other than it's going to be great. <laughs> I think it's going to work. <laughs> I'm going to pay you back. But that process, there were numerous times. And quite frankly, you know, sometimes, you know, if you if you have a good partner, I, I can remember one particular time uh, with Kate where, you know, we we needed money. And she's like, you know, we've come this far, you know, let's we'll put our house up, just, you know, put everything we own up, you know, you, you kind of run this, this far, we'll figure out something. If it doesn't work, you know, she always could work. Kate could always get jobs. She was all me. I was a little more trouble, but Kate could always, <laughs> she always worked and made money all through her entire life. But I was like, no, you know, we worked so hard to make, you know, we had put some money aside. I don't want to put it back in. You know, we did that before. And she's like, no, she's like, you will one, you're not going to let this go. Just shove the chips back in and do it. And I, we did, and it worked out, but I have to tell you, those are very, you know, you have a family you have kids. I mean, entrepreneurs, you know, you're living along the way and it is, it, you, there are some stressful times, you know, when you put, you don't realize the companies are out there. You know, and there's people behind there. There are people that have figured out how to, you know, run these companies, whether they're growing, not going, growing, doing well, not doing well. But those decisions, you know, you can, they're pretty stressful, you know. And finally, I did, we did do that. I said, you know, you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm not letting this one go and let's just do it. But I think if she had not said that, I think yeah, there were, was a point where I was like, ah. Um, this is very risky what we're doing. You know, yeah. we had a lot of debt at the time and, you know, you start, you do start questioning your decisions, waiting for it to kind of get big enough to support, you know, me, I, everything was always big. <laughs> it's going to be great, big, weird. I was always planning the next factory, but couldn't even pay off the first one. You know, so I was always moving on to the, she was like, you haven't figured out this one. You know, no, no, it's okay. We're moving on to the next one. So it is part well, of the spirit. Yeah, <laughs> that's the vision though, that, 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 that's necessary, I think, to get people behind you, right? I mean, you can't, you can't paint a tiny little vision and expect people to get excited about it. So, but, but those, I'm sure there were a lot of 3 a.m. wake ups when, when you were like sweating and panicking, uh, wondering how, you would be how many <laughs> board that? meetings there are at three o'clock in the morning. I'd be mean, one of us <laughs> with this robot. Wake up. We got to talk about this right now. <laughs> like it's three o'clock in the morning. Really? Right now? You can't, you're going to see me at work and like, no, I, I, we got to talk about this right now. I got a good idea. She's like, yes, I know. <laughs> did you, um, you know, did you keep like a piece of paper by the bed where you wrote down your ideas or did you have a place where ideas came to you like the shower or when you were running or well, I have to tell you, I, uh, cause people laugh. If, if you come into my bedroom in the morning, when you wake up, I will literally have 25 index cards on the floor. I mean, I ha they're littered. Uh, my ideas come while I'm sleeping. I am writing during the night. I do not like to forget a good idea. And even now, Kate's like, what are you thinking about? Like, there's the whole floor is full. I said, they're just <laughs> ideas. I'm trying to think up something else. And, you know, and, and I did that through my whole career that if I thought of something good, I didn't want to forget it. Now, could I do all the ideas? No, but I did. I wrote them down. That, that one advice to tell people, one idea can change your life. Yeah. You got to write them down. You got to remember them. And, and look, if it's no good, it's no good. But again, uh, I, I have just stacks and stacks of these index cards that I write stuff on, whatever it comes to me, a lot of it's at night, but I do keep yeah. track of those. 
I, I love that. You know, I just had a conversation with a guy who's running a big company and he said he kept a sheet of paper or a notepad by his bed. And he said he couldn't always read what he had written in the middle of the night, but, but he wrote it, he wrote it down. So, so keep, uh, keep a notepad, keep, keep index cards, keep something to write on all the time. Cause you never know when you're going to be inspired, maybe the middle of the night. What, what a great lesson. You know, the, I love this story. I think I could talk about it for forever, but I, I'm, I also wanted to ask you a little bit about philanthropy. Cause I know that's a really important part of what you're doing now. And, uh, I, I, it's a KMR uh, foundation. I think you support right. underserved communities. And so I'm really, um, you know, I want to ask you about your thoughts about philanthropy and kind of the legacy you want to leave, um, with, with all the work that you've done and the life that, you know, that you've developed and created. So, um, uh, Kate runs the foundation right now and I participate in it, but we also come from it sometimes from different angles because the thing that I learned was in our town, there are many organizations, many charitable organizations, and they're trying to get to a goal. They're trying to either help more people. They're trying to build a building. They're trying to get more services out there and they can sometimes lose their way. And the one thing I never liked in our town, we're here in Vancouver, Washington. It's right near Portland. It's not a, a huge town, but it has very charitable people out there. Well, deal fatigue can happen just like in the business world with charities where they're like, okay, we've been working on this one group. They were working on a, a, a shelter, homeless shelter for probably nine years. And I, I went in and I sat with the people running. I was like, this is too long for your donors. I said, you, 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 the, People are getting, they, well, we're not raising any more money. I said, I can tell you why. After nine years, they're not looking at a building. And so I retooled their plan. I gave them some money, not all the money they needed. They actually had raised quite a bit. They had lost some government funding that was going to be part of the building that kind of went away. But I said, you have to sell the vision of completion. I said, have you found a building? Are you going to rehab one? Are you going to build it? I said, people are not seeing anything other than you telling them it's coming. So to me, that kind of being part of organizations that we've helped survive monetarily, but also just planning and saying, okay, we're going to change direction here. We're going to go down this path. And a lot of, quite a few of our, you know, I approach them as investments, even though they're all charities that, okay, we want you to stay in business. How, how, this, you have a good idea. How do you keep going? How do you keep raising money? How do you go into the future? Can you change your model? Can you reduce your expenses? Can you help more people? What, what What's going to happen down the road instead of you kind of every year going, I'm, I'm out of money. I may have to close. That That's not a business model. Business people don't, can't, act that way. They'd be very sad at the end of every year if they thought, oh, that's it. I got to close. I ran out of money. So quite a bit of the work that we've done uh, is kind of also trying to help the organizations to kind of get better. And some have just done incredibly well because we, we've kind of also found pieces uh, that has helped organizations that have really become very successful. And 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 sometimes it's these kind of small changes in the beginning, you know, because sometimes you have one entrepreneur in the beginning, because there's entrepreneurs in, in charities as well, doing everything themselves. And I've sat with them and go, look, you, you, you're not doing everything yourself well. I said, what if you had a person in the office taking care of this? Or what if you had a, pro a program director that would take care of that? And they're like, well, we don't have any money for that. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll get you a program director. Now what? Oh, wow. If I had a program, I would just focus on this and that. Okay. That's not a, a huge expense, but you have to start thinking that way and not do everything yourself because you have a good idea. And this was a charity that was kind of, they weren't struggling, but they were kind of just going, getting going. And I really liked the concept, but they have since become very popular and are doing really well. 
you know what I, I, I what I love about that story is is that you are able to take what you experienced and learned building a for-profit company and helping apply that, you know, having a vision and putting the pieces in place and persevering when there wasn't any money and figuring out a way. Um, so you, you step in now and not only help provide money, but help provide strategy and a way to look at, at not-for-profits, right, right. That are making a difference. And so I love that. Um, you know, that's a, that's a phenomenal legacy and a way to take what you've learned over the years and apply it in a new context. Marty, this has been delightful. I'm, again, looking forward to seeing you later this week in person, but right. I've, I've really enjoyed our conversation. What a great legacy. What a great story. Um, you and your wife have created an amazing company, and now you're spreading that into serving a lot of others through philanthropy. So I, I commend you and congratulate you for all that. Before, before we go, I always ask my guest if they had one piece of advice for our audience, knowing a lot of our audience um, is made up of entrepreneurs who are out there trying to figure it out, or they are hoping to be out there trying to figure it out soon. Maybe they're very early stage um, in the ideas, or maybe they're already running companies. Um, what would that one piece of advice uh, be? Um, it's a story. So, I, I, you know, when I was really young, I used to go with my dad to an ice cream store. We would go maybe once a month you know, twice a month. And he always buy an ice cream sandwich. And he would, whoever broke the ice cream sandwich, you'd get to pick whether you wanted the one in the right hand or the one in the left hand. Well, one day he broke off a really small piece, but he pushed it way out ahead. And I, of course, I grabbed that piece and I opened it up and it was this little kind of half inch, one inch thing. <laughs> and I was like, that's unfair. You know, you, you, you got the way bigger piece. And, and he, he had a way of kind of schooling me through things. And he was like, well, how do you think the other person feels? You know, you, we were going to share this. So don't you think we should have split it as evenly as possible? And, and I was like, well, you know, I didn't know that you were, you know, you had pushed the T he says, yeah, cause you were greedy. You wanted to grab that bigger piece, but you really didn't think about the consequences for the other person. You just felt, hey, I want to get this. Not that I would get the smaller piece. And then he also said, you didn't ask me to open my hand. The greed just had you grab it. You didn't want the facts. You didn't ask to look at it. You just took what you thought was the bigger piece. So I kind of learned, you know, one, you got to learn how to share. Two, don't be greedy. And three, you got to do due diligence and kind of look at everything because <laughs> money, it, money and things, you know, you got to do your investigating and, and, and do your homework. And I, I kind of learned a, a pretty good bunch of good lessons from him, but th that was one of them. <laughs> I love that story. That is phenomenal. And like you said, packed with lessons that help us all. And you know, at the end of the day, if we create a situation where we win and, and the other party wins, uh, what a great outcome that is, right? Right. And what a great way we can feel about that. Thank you, Marty. This has been great. Where can our audience find out more about you or follow you or connect with you? Right now, uh, I'm at eclairhealth.com. Uh, we make healthy, better for you bars and health bars and chocolate bars. And so if you look up our website, the brand's called Cascade Chocolate and it's out there. But either one of those two things, you can find our website and you can find me. I'm, I'm there trying to think up the next big idea. That's wonderful. And you know, we're going to have to have another one of these to talk about this product and this company, because oh, obviously right. you're, you're not stopping. So thank you again, Marty, for being with me today. Thank you for having me. If you enjoyed this episode and would like to learn more about entrepreneurship, we would love it if you hit that subscribe button. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of InFactor.